Can this come in here? Okay, I'm gonna go around over here. We are live. Welcome, my YouTube and Facebook friends, and welcome, my in person friends. Thank you. I hope I hope our online audience heard the thunderous applause. Um, I'm Daniel Johnson, and I am satisfied to be in this moment where something begins, uh, even when things begin before you're ready. I bought all the different tech things I needed and left my script. And I've got an old script, and I may begin from that. But I feel, I feel the, I feel the final script within reach, on its way, from the printer. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let let this room breathe for just a moment. Look at this, the courier. Um, Caesar, Thank you, Doctor Caesar. Yeah. Nice, fresh off the press. Yeah. Hmm. Well, welcome friends and family. I I want to begin by expressing my deep gratitude for arriving in this space with you. My friends, Kat Wright and Vicki Meek, who are, who are backstage. My advisor, Dr. Luckett. And my colleagues here at Jackson State University and the Margaret Walker Center. To have the time and space to enter into a critical engagement around my current work in progress, centering creation, is really invaluable. It helps me to shape my work in ways more responsive to this moment and the city of Jackson, where it is taking place. My intention today is to bring us all into this performance, which is centered at Wolf Studio on Old Canton Road in Ward 1 of Jackson, Mississippi. This program will have three distinct sections. The first section will consist of a presentation outlining what I mean when I say that I am a socially engaged artist, the considerations that I bring to this work, and the ways in which my tools and intentions as an artist and a historian intersect in my current artwork centering creation. I will then introduce my guests, Kat Wright and Vicki Meek, who will critically engage and question this work from their own backgrounds in municipal public art activation, community engagement, and the visual arts. Both of these women have engaged with me in the past and have their own sense of the ways in which I approach the work, but neither have seen the presentation today or spoken at length with me about this particular project. They are very much a part of this performance. It felt meaningful in the context that they have a similar experience as the audience as we enter this conversation together. So that their first impression might prompt requests for clarifications where I may have blind spots or offer critical questions to open up avenues for further exploration. With their unique backgrounds, we might tease out some clarity together before we all join in dialogue around this work. The final section will bring us all into conversation together. Each of you in the audience are engaging your own discipline in innovative ways and have something vital to add to how we are thinking about our subject. This final section will be an opportunity for a learning exchange, sharing our own thoughts on the ways in which the questions and methodologies posed by this session might inform your own practices and critiquing what I have presented today as a way to help shape this project and make it better. The first question that someone asks when you say that you're an artist is, what kind of artist are you? 
As someone who has been involved across multiple disciplines, dance, theater, music and writing, and worked in multiple visual arts, painting, sculpture, media production and installation, it was always a bit of a struggle for me to answer this question directly. In 2012, the French immigrant South Carolinian artist Guylaine Gallimard gave me a copy of Pablo Helguera's Education for Socially Engaged Art. And I felt I finally had a center point for the ideas that were orbiting around within my work. Helguera wrote the book in 2011 in response to an invitation to teach a course on socially engaged art at Portland State University. While there was an in-depth of writing on the subject, tracing the roots of the form back to the community-based practices and feminist education theory of the 1960s, he found the study to be primarily art historical with no real reference manual for the materials and techniques of the form. As such, he wrote the first book intended to map out the definitions, the tools, taxonomies, and tensions within the discipline, much like any other medium has books entirely devoted to the use and substance of the material itself. I share this first quote to offer a working definition for socially engaged art that focuses in on how the art form is functioning. Because socially engaged artists are not tied to any particular medium in the traditional sense, I think it is useful to call attention to the character of the role the artist is playing. Because it is a work based in social engagement, there is necessarily a relationship unfolding between the artist and others in which the creation is emerging. Depending on the nature of the work they are doing together, socially engaged artists often find themselves ambiguously inhabiting problem-solving spaces where they are bringing considerations from non-arts disciplines to bear on their work. For this reason, I really like Kalgera's reference to the quote, temporary snatching away of subjects into the realm of art making in ways which bring new insight and make visible new problems or conditions of the task at hand, which may otherwise remain hidden if approached with the traditional considerations of the profession the artist is borrowing from. I share this second quote, because much good art is made without expressing the method in such technical terms. In her 2018 book, Performing Revolutionary, Art, Action, Activism, Nicole Garneau documents 60 interactive public performances of hers she calls uprisings, held monthly over the course of five years. I bring this quote alongside Helgera's because it focuses on the artistic self as an essential quality from which any action then performed by the artist can be understood as an expression of that character of self. It is not uncommon for people to question the validity of the claim that non-traditional art forms are truly art at all. And you may question that yourself when we get to your role in critiquing this work. Nicole claims this space in the arts for the types of world building which brings community together to imagine and realize the future they want to share. As Nicole, I similarly feel that because I am, quote, trained as an artist, when I make projects that are the creative manifestations of my hopes and dreams for the world, I call them art. Now, once I've told someone that I am a socially engaged artist, the obvious follow-up question is, well, what exactly does socially engaged art look like? I say that I facilitate groups of people to share the stories they tell about themselves and look for the intersections in their stories where we can learn, lean into shared visions for the future. In bringing their visions to life, participants claim roles in the story of our work together and are encouraged to exercise agency in those roles. My job is primarily to hold space for us to be together, 
direct resources into that space and facilitate collaboration among the group. When pushed on what truly makes what I do art, I focus on the generation of meaning. In these large scale community-based collaborations, accomplishing the tasks we have set for ourselves is never more important than the relationships we hold with each other, with our spaces, and in respect to our history and memory. At any particular moment, there are a set of circumstances in which we find ourselves, which communicates something about the nature of the relationships present. I am most interested in what the particular circumstances communicate about the power dynamics present. Is everyone experiencing a sense of belonging? What agreements have been made? And where are we appealing to an outside authority? And how are we demonstrating that we care about each other and the histories we bring with us? As a facilitator of collaboration, focusing first on power dynamics helps us to shift toward equity in the conversations and work we are holding together so that the emerging artistic production better reflects everyone involved. At this point, in trying to explain who I am as a socially engaged artist, there is admittedly still a nebulous quality to what I am saying. My questioner says, that sounds amazing, but what does it look like? And generally, only a story will suffice. So to bring greater clarity into this conversation on socially engaged art, allow me to take a moment to share about one of my current works in progress, Centering Creation. A bit over 80 years ago, Carl and Mildred Wolf began slowly cleaning a two acre property along Old Canton Road Carl had purchased prior to his service in World War II. At the time, they would ride the trolley to the north end of the line where it stopped at the intersection of State Street and Meadowbrook, which is just north of downtown. And then they would walk a mile and a half down the dirt road, which is now Old Canton Road, in order to reach the property. Carl had built a small studio on the back edge of the land, which still stands. And they would spend the day clearing thorns and brush while dreaming of their life together in this idyllic landscape. I never met Carl. By the time I came to Wolf Studio in my 20s, entire lifetimes passed. Carl and Mildred, both prolific artists well known in Mississippi, had lived their lives, raised their family, and established a studio which was widely known. Their daughter, B.B. Wolf, had moved back to the land in the 1980s at the end of Carl's life to help her mother continue the business. The small gallery and workspace sold Mildred's prints and small sculptural forms, mostly birds, when I returned to the, when I came to the studio. Bibi hired me 16 years ago, shortly after Hurricane Katrina had torn through the coast and all the way up to Jackson. Some of the oldest pine trees had fallen and crushed part of Carl's original studio. The fallen trees were turned into planks on site and used to rebuild what they had broken and to add two more buildings to hold all of the ceramic work. A meditation dojo had been built a few years earlier and a few years later, a studio for Bibi would be added as the business grew and space became limited. There are 10 structures on the site, ranging from small buildings like the outhouse and woodshop to two historic homes, the meditation space and the studio spaces and gallery. I worked at Wolf Studio managing the Slipcast production for seven years before leaving in 2013 to become the Director of Engagement and Learning at the Mississippi Museum of Art. 
Over the past nine years, I have worked inside the cultural in, inside cultural institutions, on the boards of large nonprofit organizations, and on a series of large scale projects to facilitate groups to realize shared goals. I began to work on my master's in history here at Jackson State to add to my toolkit as I worked with community stories. I produced projects at the Jackson Medical Mall with the city of Jackson, Galloway Elementary School, University of Mississippi Medical Center, the Mississippi Department of Transportation, and a partnership between the Margaret Walker Center and the Kellogg Foundation to celebrate the opening of the new Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. My career was on a satisfying arc when the pandemic hit two years ago, and suddenly the act of bringing strangers together to share space and work alongside each other was a non-starter. As my work fell into deeper and deeper crisis, I was able to focus my creative energy on myself and my family. I became reflective that in much of my work, I had been a bit of an interloper. The outsider within a, without a true stake in the outcome of the projects beyond my stake as a Jackson community member. I began to wonder about possibilities for grounding a project in my own story. Of course, as an artist with a family, my most urgent wondering was about any project grounded in reality with a real paycheck attached to it. After a year of barely holding it together, I called BB in the hopes that Wolf Studio might be able to offer some hours of work. After some thought, BB shared that she really needed a handyman. I told her I wasn't sure if I was a handyman, but I could certainly perform handy work. I had not been back on site at Wolf Studio more than a week when all of my intervening experiences came into my mind relative to the everyday work I was performing. The Wolf Studio was a sustainable business employing 10 local artists and open regular hours six days a week. And yet BB and her husband David were in their 70s and 80s, and there had never been the time or space while running the business to develop a succession plan. At some point, it would be necessary to find a conclusion to the business, and the property would transfer hands to family members who lived distant from Mississippi and had no reason or ability to continue the legacy. Having worked in the cultural and nonprofit sector and being an artist who facilitated community activity as an artistic practice, it was clear that an invitation to maintain the property could have deeper implications than just tending to the immediate needs at hand. By the time I sent my first invoice for the work, I had made the shift toward performing the work as part of my artistic practice. Wolf Studio commissions the work on a monthly basis, initially as a performance of handiwork and caretaking, but officially becoming a centering creation in January of this year. By paying hourly, we could separate out what aspects of the performance were being directly commissioned and what aspects I was developing on my own to support the growth of the project and how that evolved over time. During the initial period from May of last year through the summer, I committed to moving slowly. There was space and time to allow the work to develop in response to BB and David, the staff and community stakeholders as they found their own roles in the work. I met with BB on the summer solstice to offer my long-term commitment to this project and hear from her broadly on her visions of the potential futures which lie ahead. In that meeting, we were able to clarify a need for archiving the historic documents housed in the original home still standing on the property, a desire to understand and record the narrative of her family, and the need to map out a transition for the business in recognition that 10 local artists earned their livelihoods there. And BB and David are deeply intertwined with it, not just financially, but in their daily 
purpose. Over the past year, we have developed a meaningful practice of sharing stories and history in conjunction with and to inform the maintenance and repair of the buildings and property. There are four historic buildings on the site and the Mississippi Department of Archives and History has visited and advised us on their support for historic designation of the entire property. We have set up an archive space and a cataloging process where for the past seven months, we have regularly made time to process correspondence, accounting documents, notes and essays on art, photos and travel logs, interviews and articles, images of artwork, and more. My work as the Andrew W. Mellon Graduate Assistant at the Margaret Walker Center has helped to inform and drive that performance of archiving. Slowly, stakeholders in the legacy of the Wolf Studio and property have come into the work. Susan Anand, an art therapist who is part of one of the four community meditation groups who use the dojo on the property. Elise Smith, an art historian retired from Millsaps College where Mildred Wolf began the art history program. Leslie Collins and Katie Carter, close friends and staff artists at the studio. Monique Davis, managing director of the Center for Art and Public Exchange and a longtime collaborator of mine and others. A first draft of a mission, vision, and set of activities have been created toward establishing a foundation which would purchase the capital assets of the studio and carry on the business and spirit of the Wolf family through continuing to cultivate creativity, contemplation, and stewardship, both of the land and their narrative, all on the property. These proposed activities would include creative, academic, and land-based residencies at the property, oral history collection, and programming to share the story and continue to expand our knowledge. And in the next few weeks, my performance will for the first time intersect formally with the staff as I begin to lead bi-weekly staff meetings where we will interweave updates on the centering creation work with the everyday work of production and sales. Even my thesis here at JSU has become intertwined with this project focusing in on Carl Wolf's writings on race and his own relationships with specific black Mississippians through the Jim Crow era of racial segregation and terror and into the early years of integration, which in Mississippi didn't begin and even nascently until 1969. In all of this work, patience and attention to the moment have been a primary focus even as we work with the material of the past and visions of the future. In Adrienne Marie's Brown's 2017 book, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds, Adrienne shares thoughts, observations, and questions on, quote, how we apply the brilliance of the world around us to our efforts to coexist in and with this world as humans particularly for those of us seeking to transform the crises of our time to turn our legacy toward harmony. Brown draws on the idea of emergence as a concept best suited to discussing this wonder in the world. Quoting Nick Obolensky's complex adaptive leadership, embracing paradox and uncertainty, Adrian shares the definition Emergence is the way complex systems and patterns arise out of a multiplicity of relatively simple interactions. In her own words, Adrienne highlights that emergence emphasizes critical connections over critical mass, building authentic relationships, listening with all the senses of the body and the mind. That emergence notices the way small actions and connections create complex systems, patterns that become ecosystems and societies. As the participants in centering creation move within the work, Adrienne Marie Brown's application of the concept of emergence resonates. The small interactions with the landscape, the observation and attention to the built environment 
which calls us to care and maintenance. The everyday discussions of the workings of the business as nested within the life of the property and our own sense of personal individual meaning derived from our participation and proximity to that work. Attention to these critical connections create the basis for authentic relationships of care for each other. Big visions are held at arm's length and allowed to steep. Never more important than the immediate impacts of each day and malleable to be shaped to accommodate who we all are in its ecosystem moment to moment. The attention to each small action slowly revealing patterns of care as organization emerges to support what might become. Having a problem advancing my slide. The slides may come, but I will continue. When Helgera talks of the community socially engaged art creates, he says its participants willingly engage in a dialogue from which they extract enough critical and experiential wealth to walk away feeling enriched, perhaps even claiming some ownership of the experience or ability to reproduce it with others. But when we think about this critical and experiential wealth that is being drawn from this experience within Centering Creation, I think it is useful to dig beyond the general and ask what it is which everyone is gravitating toward to commit to this work. What centers this community of participants? I want to check in actually with my StreamYard producers to, to see if you think it's still being streamed because I want to make sure the slide is still but it's streaming. I just want to make sure my panelists are still hearing what they're going to comment on. Okay. At this point in the project, just one year into a work that I believe will live beyond me, there is consensus that to continue the activity of the community is to center creativity, contemplation, and stewardship. But there is certainly something deeper which pulls people to the place and its activity. I find that many have intertwined some aspect of their identity with what Wolf Studio represents to them. And I think creating a space where people can claim greater roles in what is unfolding on that land will reveal something meaningful about all of us. And that is my art. And now, I think we should all take a collective breath. If you're like me, there's a bit of labor to listen to anyone speak for 25 minutes. So I want to recognize you're all performing alongside me, and we must be mindful of our bodies. So please center your own creation. Right now, if you need to stretch or you need to take care of yourself in any way, please feel free in this space to do so. I'm now going to try and stop sharing and transition toward my two friends who have graciously agreed to be put on the spot. To respond to this work first. looks like things are still functioning as they should be. I like to live in a libertary culture where we recognize we're all building this together in the moment and can respond and keep it together.
Okay, so please allow me to introduce two truly phenomenal figures doing impactful works in the arts every day in their own communities at local, state, and national levels. Cat Wright, oops, here we go. I'll go full screen. Can make us even bigger. I think we're like, Cat, I think you are like eight feet by 20 feet on the screen. I mean, that is amazing, seeing as how I'm five feet tall in real life. So finally, <laughs> I've achieved grandeur. I'm excited. So Cat Wright joined Public Art Chattanooga in October 2018 as a program coordinator with extensive arts and social services experience. Upon relocating to Chattanooga, she earned a Master of Public Administration in Local Government Management, where her capstone research focused on public art and urban renewal while she was serving as major projects manager for the Association for Visual Arts. And Lauren, if we could bring all three of us on the screen for just a little moment. Kat served as the advanced logistics lead for 2019's International Placemaking Week, hosted by Project for Public Spaces, and currently serves on the Culture Heritage Arts Advisory Committee with the Chattanooga Tourism Company, the board of directors at the Chattanooga Theater Center, and the Downtown Council of the Chattanooga Chamber of Commerce. Kat continues to stay abreast of industry best practices and policies with specific interest in racial equity and the arts. She was selected as one of 55 individuals from across the country to participate in the Americans for the Arts Artists at the Community Development Table training in 2019. She completed 18 months of continuing education through Race Forward's Governmental Alliance on Race and Equity as part of the Community Engagement Core Team for the City of Chattanooga in 2020, and completed the Phase One workshop from the Racial Equity Institute in 2021. She began her service as Director of Public Arts Chattanooga in December 2020. Vicki Meek, born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, is a nationally recognized artist who is exhibited widely and has work in permanent collections from Houston to Dallas, Indiana to Connecticut and beyond. She was awarded three public arts commissions with the Dallas area rapid transit art program and was co-artist on the largest public art project in Dallas, the Dallas Convention Center Public Art Project. Meek was selected as one of 10 national artists to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Nasher Sculpture Center with the commissioning of a site-specific installation. Meek's retrospective, Vicki Meek, Three Decades of Social Commentary, opened in November 2019 at Houston Museum of African American Culture. Vicki Meek has been awarded a number of grants and honors, including National Endowment for the Arts, NFRIG grant, Dallas Observer Mastermind Award, Women of Visionary Influence Mentor Award, Dallas Women's Foundation Mara Award, and she was selected as the 2021 Texas Artist of the Year by Art League of Houston. In addition to having a studio practice, Vicki Meek is an independent curator and writes cultural criticism for Dallas Weekly with blog Art and Race Notes, as well as having had a monthly column, Articulate, for Theater Jones, an online performing arts magazine. With over 40 years of arts admin administrative experience that includes working as a senior program administrator for a state arts agency, a local arts agency, and running a nonprofit visual arts center, Vicki Meek retired in March 2016 as the manager of the South Dallas Cultural Center. She served on the board of National Performance Network, Visual Artist Network, from 2008 to 15, and was chair from 2012 to 2014. In 2016, Vic Vicki Meek was selected to be a fellow in the Intercultural Leadership Institute and also became a voting member of Alternate Roots, a Southeast Regional Artist Service Organization. Vicki Meek currently spends time as Chief Operating Officer and Board Member, and I should have written the pronunciation when I asked for it, <laughs> Why don't you let, let you say this? Usekra. Usekra. Creative investigation. 
the Sekera Center for Creative Investigation. Thank you, Vicky. A nonprofit retreat for creatives in Costa Rica, founded by internationally acclaimed performance artist Elia Arce. Thank you. <laughs> she, <laughs> Vicky is also the Dal Dallas Mayor Eric Johnson's at-large appointment to the Arts and Culture Commission and the Public Art Committee. Vicky Meek is represented by Tally Dunn Gallery in Dallas, Texas. For this section, I'm going to turn to each of our panelists one at a time to offer initial reflections on my presentation and to ask one or two questions that they think will clarify important aspects of the work. Following these initial exchanges, the three of us will shift into conversation together. This section will last between 20 and 30 minutes and should leave about the same amount of time to bring our in-person audience into the discussion with reflections, critical opinions, and questions for any of us. Viewers on Facebook and YouTube are also encouraged to ask questions and offer reflections in the chat. And I believe we'll be able to pull some of those into the conversation as well. So, Lauren, if we can transition to just me and Kat, I am gonna turn this over to Kat for your impromptu response to this presentation. Thank you so much. You are so very welcome. And I'm, I'm delighted and honored to be in this space with you all uh, this morning. I will tell you that impromptu thought is not necessarily my strong suit, especially when you are given such a, a rich depth of, of work. Um, well done to you, Daniel, for such a thoughtful and considerate presentation that I quite frankly am, am still sort of digesting. But that being said, I'm going to, to sort of um, approach it from a local government lens that, you know, quite frankly, in the South, some, some local governments aren't as progressive as others. And so we have a lot of challenges as arts administrators to continue to vouch for what public dollars can be used for and what the what the return on investment is, correct? That's a sort of a, a dreaded word, but a word that we've all gotten used to, which is very difficult to do when you're thinking about socially engaged practice, right? It's a, it's it's really leaning on that construct and and it is challenging that. Um, one of the things from a government perspective that I would be curious about, you mentioned that uh, during the time that you were making a lot of repairs physically to the property and, and you had a robust attendance that was paying for, um, you know, attendance to enter the property. And then you, you went on to say that there was, that you were working with um, a number of historical societies and so forth. I'm curious uh, as someone who constantly has to, to sometimes supplement public money with private money in order to keep things going, what, at what point did or has or will it sort of the, in the progression of this project, have you had to really say and validate what you are doing as it relates to possibly finding additional funding? So, um, you know, with, with any kind of large scale work, you know, oftentimes, you know, you're, and, and I think this is kind of the, one of the things you're getting at, like you, you, you start to pull from different pockets of money and from organizations who have different missions and reasons for giving. Um, and so, you know, you know, I, I talked about it, it began, like the funding began really in response to a practical need of the studio. They needed a handyman. And there are a lot of times as an artist, where I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, about the budget of an organization and maybe they have advertising dollars over here. They've got kind of research innovation dollars over here. And I'm making the case that the artwork that I'm doing meets the, 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 the implications and the needs of different areas of their budget to so get them to start shifting that money over. And so, you know, it, it begins with this funding around the, the handiwork and maintenance of the property. And, 
And within that, as an artist, you know, wanting to really make the case that it is truly artwork that I'm doing, then I have to be very explicit because ultimately someone's going to say, well, yeah, you say it's art, but in fact, someone's really just paying you to fix the cabinet. Um, so, you know, that, that meant having in-depth conversations on the clock with BB and David about the artwork itself. Um, being inclusive on the clock about sharing stories and talking about the history of the, the architecture of a building in order to, to come to decisions about exactly how we would move forward in, in what we replaced, what was restored, um, and kind of the how we balanced those, those considerations. Now, when we bring MD, MDH, Mississippi Department of Archives and History in, um, starting to get those historical designations on the property can begin to bring different pools of funding that will, that will fund the restoration projects um, and developments that we might wanna do on the property. That's more of a future focused piece. Um, I mentioned the graduate assistantship with the Margaret Walker Center. You know, the, the, the Andrew W. Mellon uh, graduate assistantship was a funding stream that was available that my advisor knew existed, knew there was a need for, knew what I was doing um, on site at Wolf Studio and, and saw that, that connection. Um, and so kind of that speaks to, you know, how an artist kind of by having ongoing relationships where people understand their work other people start to see, just like someone sends you an email about every grant that, that's available, uh, you know, they start to see, oh, this is an intersection. So that pulled money into funding that, that cataloging work that I, that I was doing for, for you know, of, of my own volunteering. Uh, so, you know, like, like you see in projects, an artist will do something kind of on their own dime for a while while they're trying to find funding and then they plug it in. Um, and then that other piece is, is looking for, for arts-based grants, which can be really different engaged art. A lot of foundations do not see this type of work as art at all. Mm -hmm. um, or if they do, they haven't yet figured out how to, to allow it to happen and be funded. Um, but I've, I've managed with, with organizations like Alternate Roots especially, um, there have been these opportunities to write smaller grants, and we just applied for a larger Partners for Change grant that would be an 18 month uh, support that would come with uh, technical organizational planning support, um, as well as kind of a 10 to $20,000 pocket of money to apply where half could be applied to, to wages and labor that I'm doing. Um, and then the other to start to experiment with some of the programming that I talked about. Fascinating. I, I want to kind of extend on a, a thought that I had earlier. Uh, did the Department of History's when they came in and kind of started looking at uh, areas of the property for uh, historic re uh, registration and so forth, th did they have a, did they feel that certain portions of the property should be attended to that were in conflicts or against what the property owners felt? So I actually managed that relationship in a fairly tight way. So that by the time they got to the property, there was a, a kind of a deeper awareness of the anxieties of the property owners, you Perfect. know, to, to really give them a sense of like, okay, this is where we are at this moment in this artwork. You know, this is an artwork where we're really centering, you know, what, the, the personal lives of two people who are, who are really at the, the fulcrum of what can happen and how the future can unfold. Um, and, and I think, you know, in many ways that I could see where that changed their language. Mm. It, I think, you know, I could see them sharing and I, and I knew some of them personally um, and I talked to them about their other work. You know, I could see where they were, they were really sharing off ramps, and, and, and historical designations and being very attentive to what the requirements would be of the property owner, if this, then this. And so, you know, I think it, 
in the context of the artwork, it, it really spoke to that need to to slow down um, the the kind of the drive that people's profession puts them into, where there's an objective, and actually say, okay, let's 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 be attentive to the personal needs of people involved. That's beautifully put. That is absolutely beautifully put. Um, and closing for me, and then I'll, we can turn it over to Vicky. Um, I think what may be important for the group at large to, to hear is. Have you had to, and I, and I I don't like this word, but I'm going to say it, pivot, so to speak, um, in the sense of sometimes, no matter how um, liberal and relationship building you do, you do come at this point where there's an there's right an impasse, and sometimes you don't see, especially when you're talking with um, very bureaucratic, systematic agents that. We're with you for a while on this train, but at some point, there is that likelihood that it will fizzle. Can you describe, if you've had any yet, that that opportunity where you've had to pivot in terms of funding or in terms of maybe seeking other partners because they just have continue to be as responsive because of the ambiguous nature of your process? So I'm going to talk about a, a smaller pivot that, that I think might speak to how I'll handle a larger pivot that I've not yet had to face. And mainly because we, we haven't reached a place where we're so intertwined in bureaucratic processes, which will come. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but we have not reached that phase. And, and so, you know, as I was bringing in kind of community stakeholders into uh, a group of people who were going to be committed to really being a sounding board for the development of the project, and I named some of those people in the, in the, in the presentation, um, there, you know, I, I did that at the beginning of the year. And of course, you know, it, it's easy as a human, you're kind of see the world through the lens of your your own personal experience and what's happening in your life right now and um and of course you know i'm thinking oh i'm gonna i'm gonna pass them this and they're gonna get it back you know in february we're all gonna gather as a group and eat a meal together so these people can get to know each other better um and really immediately i realized which for some reason it should never be a surprise but it's always kind of hits me it's like, oh, these people have their own lives that they're living and their own things that they're doing. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so I really had to shift a little bit in, in how I was managing those relationships. And, and, and while I'm kind of always thinking in these terms, um, it, it was a reminder that I can fall into a, a, a very transactional relationship with people and in and, and my thinking about and my approach. And, and, and I had to slow down and, and say, okay, I actually need to be attentive to the personal lives of these people and recognize that this is one more relationship that I'm going to have to, to nurture and spend time with um, and make space to, to sit down with them to really understand where they are and be a sounding board for them. If there's going to be a reciprocal relationship where they're they're then able to be a sounding board in a way that's fulsome um, and deeper than it might have been if they had been responsible in that transactional way. So I, I think it's hard for people to imagine that I do that with bureaucracies, but in very frustratingly way, I I do I do that to bureaucracies, and sometimes it makes them exit stage left. Um, uh, but sometimes it, it actually opens up a really rich territory where we start to able to change their bureaucracy because we have a real world example moving through their bureaucracy that they can become an advocate for. Well, and that is why you are you are a kindred spirit to me, Daniel Johnson. Most definitely. I will let you turn it over to Vicki. And I hope my my questions were helpful for the group at large. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kay. Well, like Kat, I want to thank you, Daniel, for bringing, bringing me into this conversation. 
and um, having a, an audience for it, because I think it's important that um, the kind of work that you're engaged in is um, something that a lot of people are not that familiar with. Um, and uh, we are having all kinds of conversations nationally now about this whole notion of social engagement and what that means. Um, so, you know, bringing some clarity on a particular project, I think, is always useful. I want to I want to, because Kat handled the arts administrative side of this so well, I, I don't want to put my arts administration cap on. I want to talk to you artist to artist as an artist who is also involved in social engagement work and, and, and speak a little bit about, one, the importance of this whole notion of preservation and sustainability and, and then ask you some questions about where are the um your, your friends on the secession planning at this point um because i think that's pretty critical to um what we're talking about as far as how this project continues to have a life beyond their lives um so i want to talk about that and then i i also think that it's really critical this piece about stewardship of community assets and how we as artists in our communities use our creativity in order to um, further the cause of, of um, being good stewards of the assets that we feel are important. Uh, and that may not be getting the kind of recognition that they deserve, you know, either because they're not seen as being major institutions of some sort that need preservation or whatever the reason, you know, and sometimes it's, you know, racism because of nobody thinking it's important to preserve those kinds of things. But I want to talk a little bit about that notion of how we as artists are really responsible to these institutions and these um, community assets that may not know that they are that kind of an asset. And then I guess the last thing that I wanted to, to propose to you is that this was said to me when I was talking about one of the projects that I'm going to be doing. You need to also have someone documenting your process in this whole project because you know all we ever get and part of the reason why we have a, a hard time sort of uh, convincing people that these are bona fide art projects is we usually end up with this sort of anecdotal you know evidence of the work and what we really need to start thinking about is how can we provide a roadmap for other artists in the future who want to do this kind of work um, so that it's clear how much, first of all, how much work is involved in establishing the relationships that you're establishing and what kind of, of um, what kind of community uh, investment an artist has to make in order for this kind of a project to really take legs and walk off and become its own thing at another time. So I, can we can we talk a little bit about, let, let's start with the, um, the the notion of the preservation, sustainability, and succession planning, what's what's happening there? Um, so in, in this moment in the project, um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm thinking about two, two things uh, that I'll bring forward in response to that question. Um, you know, we, we started to use the term succession planning about two months ago. And, and that was one of those really important moments where, you know, it, it kind of everything distills in a conversation and you're able to really say exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, deeper than that, that kind of led to that salient moment is, is, is this conversation that I'm always having with Bibi. You know, Bibi is my mentor. She gave me my first job where I made all my, my income from art. And, um, and so kind of at, at the root of this is a mentor-mentee relationship where the mentee sees that their mentor has entered this, this kind of final part of the journey. And, and, and I wanted to create a situation where, you know, as Bibi moves in this last phase of life, she has the most agency to, to create art and not be down in the weeds of, of a business. 
Um, and this is something that she communicate, you know, over time, you know, this desire. And so I was responsive to this, this, this communication she was giving um, with this artwork. Um, but, you know, it was like having those conversations that really led to this place of like, this is about transitioning you out of the business, the everyday business. And so, you know, we are actually at a moment where, you know, over long, over, over years, BB has kind of ambiguously handed off pieces of management. Um, and, but we're finally at a place where we have really articulated and written a job description for a, for BB's role. Mm -hmm. And are, are, and are in that process of, of, of search to, to, to bring someone in who, who will become that, that figure and be at that pinch point of the business so that BB can really start to release that. Um, and I know it's going to be hard and awkward and all of those beautiful things. Um, but, uh, but, but, but to have written that job description was kind of a, a monumental moment um, and gets a little bit to the documentation question. So I may bring that up again later. Uh, I'll, I'll share one more short story in regards to this idea of, of um, stewardship. And, 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 I'm, and I'm thinking of it in, in a particular way. Maybe I just want to share this story, but it's another big moment. Um, you know, we were doing the archiving and cataloging and BB is doing that. It's very intimate. And 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 all of the stuff is either in, in Mildred category or a Carl category. And we would come across things that were BBs and she would kind of put it to the side and be like, oh, I'll take this up to my house. And and I would kind of talk about, well, shouldn't you be in this archive? <laughs> you know, you're, you're part of this story. Um, and it was and it was only, you know, I mean, it was like six months into the to the project where we, we came to one of those documents and BB was like, you know, I guess there should be a folder, you know, and, and writing her name on a folder, you know, and there's no documentation of that. But it's but it was one. It was a monumentous moment where it was this real shifting of BB's sense of legacy, you know, to be able to say, yes, I am part of this story that is worthy of being archived in this way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so documenting your process. So, you know, documentation is one of the things that falls away when you don't have time because you care about the people you care about the project and at some point you're like okay well i don't have time to to document in the way that i know it should be documented um you know i document through pictures that i take day to day you know i make small videos you know a lot of the ways i think about documentation is as an artistic process you know product itself um, which starts to bend and warp how people think about documentation and, and begs the question of, is this legitimate documentation? Um, but, you know, in, in some ways, some of the, 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 the tools of being a historian become this creation of documentation. You know, to, to be able to walk into that room and have cataloged in an organized way all of 80 years of, of papers you know, itself is evidence of the work. Um, and so there are these, you know, you know, oral histories recorded and made available become evidence of the work. And in some ways that, that continues to bend this notion of what is documentation. Um, but, but there's certainly more to be done. Um, but but I, I would say, you know, even those, those like the job description, to go back to that, when we create a job description together, it becomes this documentation of the performance, you know, where it's kind of solidified into some concrete, tangible thing that is evidence of the work. And so I often, I often go back to this statement, and you're hearing me repeat it, evidence of the work is documentation, um, but it is not the documentation that the art world looks to to prove something happened. And so there, there, there's a gap there. That, yeah. That... What, and what I was, what I was thinking, cause this, this is, you're talking about the same kind of thing that I was talking about to the person that was questioning me 
uh, who was, by the way, somebody who's in a foundation world. Um, and then he clarified for me, he said, no, 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 no. I mean, there needs to be an outside documenter of your process. So it's not you who are responsible for documenting you. It's that you are being documented in an official kind of way. And then he said, you know, like, and I'm interested in supporting that kind of, of documentation. That's really actually what I'm getting at here as well, is that it would be, I mean, it becomes another thing that could potentially be funded by an outside source because of the kind of work that you're doing and the way that you're approaching it is not, you know, it's not something we have readily available to us documentation of process. Um, and it could be very valuable for all of the people who are working in this idea of, you know, what we used to call community artists, but now are called socially engaged artists. Um, all of the people working in, in that realm could benefit from having something that's tangible that they can look to when you're when you're gone you know or, or when you're done um as a roadmap sort of you know in terms of how how you went about doing this so that's that's kind of the, the kind of documentation that i was talking about which i said was not even what i was thinking of initially until this person you know said to me no no that's not what i'm not not what i mean i mean something that really is somebody documenting you as you do this work in community. So anyway, that's just a thought, you know, that that might become something that uh, could be a, a, um, a fundable aspect of the project. And I think the, the other thing I wanted to just query you about, because we've actually talked about this in the past, um, is your role in long-term, your role in this um, process. Um, where do you see yourself going with this this project? Um, and do you see this being something that you will use as a um, bridge to some other kinds of things in the in the Jackson community? Um, so I kind of have two answers to that. You know, like one answer is, you know, I have I have this mantra that, you know, everything needs to be an end in itself that that if i start to see some some future destination through the person in front of me that i'm moving toward that i stop to see that person um and so even when i'm having a conversation with the, the department of archives and history um I have to remind myself that my goal in that conversation is not to find out about historic designations. It's not to even bring them to Wolf Studio. It's to learn about their day, to learn about who they are as a human being. And, and if done right, we're going to end up where we need to be with the, the, the kind of particulars of, of the, the larger picture. Um, and then if we don't end up there, maybe the picture will shift. Um, so, so there's that. Um, but you know, I, I think also what I see happening in those relationships is that every one of those relationships becomes a bridge, you know, because that person is bringing aspects of themselves to the work. They are expanding the picture of what we're doing together. And, and, and that picture is, is often community based. So that picture is also becomes this further invitation to another group of people, um, to expand our thinking around, well, what do we mean by contemplation? And what do we, and, and how do we imagine that connects to Wolf Studio and the activity that has historically happened here? Okay, well, those are my questions. <laughs> well, I think, I think I'm gonna skip over the three of us in conversation because there's about 12 minutes left and I wanna bring the, the okay. audience in and, um, and the three of us or, you know, whoever it makes sense can, and kind of talk about whatever's prompted by our audience. And I think I got my speaker positioned correctly, so y'all should hear what they're saying, but I'll check in and make sure. Um, and I've got this microphone. Let's, let's start with that conversation online. And if someone has a question, I'm gonna give this to Gary. And Gary can be my microphone runner. That is well told. Thank you, Gary. Okay, so we got one on uh, Helen Crump. 
Good to see you. Thank you. Good point, Vicky. Documenting the artist's own process from inception to implementation is important to a broader understanding of the art, the creativity at play in the overall project. Two, it helped to solidify the artistic for those questioning the artistic nature of the work project. It's true. Very true. Yeah, it's 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 funny this this idea of of proving that it's art, um, and and in a lot of ways it it it, it reveals a, a little bit of um, hypocrisy to my statement that that there is there's everyone is an end and every relationship is an end in itself because I I will be transparent I am interested in moving the art world. I am interested in changing the perception of what art is in our everyday lives. And so I do always have in the back of my mind this motivation to, to create this proof that what I'm doing is indeed an artwork. Um, and let me interject, um, Daniel, that I'm, I'm not looking at the documentation as a proof. I'm looking at the documentation as a roadmap. You know, I mean, it's really about allowing others who want to be engaged in this kind of work to have some, you know, mentorship without being in your presence um, about how this work gets developed. So I don't, you know, I don't really give a damn if people think it's, it, you know, proving whatever. I, I don't really care about any of that. Um, I think it's an, it's important to um, provide some guidance for others who are interested in doing this work in more than simple anecdotal ways, because the anecdotes don't necessarily help the other artists understand the depth of what's involved in this kind of work. Yeah, and, and the weight of responsibility you take on. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. So that's my, that's my interest in the documentation, not proving that it's art, you know. Well, let me reveal something that I'm self-conscious about. But okay. but yeah, you're duly noted, duly noted. I think we've got a, a question in the audience. Uh, I'm just awestruck by the, uh, uh, the potential um, that you have, the power that you have. The, uh, you know, David and Vivi are extraordinary folks. Or you mentioned the word fulcrum. They are social fulcrum or are catalyst for a lot of sort of different ways of thinking in the Jackson area. And they have a history themselves, and they're, they're so this personality uh, person interplay with the place and placemaking and all that going on. And so that's going to be an extraordinary, interesting way you deal with this piece of art as you talk about it. And the, the layer that I, I find most interesting is the stories themselves of David and Vivi, and David coming out of a youngster out of a, a communal background out of California. And then later on, being an engineer, but with an artistic flair, how often do you find that? And those types of things, uh, these are some really interesting people who were also uh, interplaying with the personality of Jackson at a time when there was a little bit of uh, opportunity for change. And so I, I'd like to also see that Jackson, too, is seen as a character in, the, in, in your artwork at that period of time that allowed for that. Daniel, can you repeat what he, the, the, the gist of what he said? I couldn't really hear everything. Yes. Um, so our our, our uh, friend in the audience is um, kind of noting the the, the story aspects and, and these kind of layers of of the personal stories. You know how those those make up this this story of Wolf Studio. That Wolf Studio is then. You know, a, a character in Jackson, and then Jackson is this this character itself that has a story, and these kind of you know layers of of how these stories move in and out of these spaces as they're told. Um, and I, I really appreciate you bringing that forward, and um, and and it's and it's you know at, at this stage in this project, it's interesting how how small things are, you know, and then all of a sudden they'll get real big. And um, and I'll, I'll tell a, a short story that I love is, you know, directly related to what our, our friend brought up about uh, David, who, who himself was raised in this this communal setting in California. 
um, which makes him this unique presence on, on site. Um, and also is like an, has an engineering background, but is also has like a creative artistic side that he applies, you know, especially in this idea where they're building the buildings. Um, you know, David, we we were we were trying to hoist something up onto the roof. And David, he's like, oh, there's this plastic bag of ropes in the truck. And I go and I get these ropes and I take them out. And it's just this mess of ropes. And he's like, these are the ropes that I used when I was um, commercially fishing for crab out of a tiny boat off of the main coastline. And then goes on to this huge story about being on this boat in a storm. And he's like so tiny and all these other huge boats and he gets lost. And, um, and, and that's that moment where you realize that in our, in our, in our everyday lives, we're often unaware of, of the, the deep stories that are attached to the objects that are circulating around us. And there's the opportunity when you know, I'm explicit that this is an artwork. And, we, and I really talked to David about what that means, that it's an invitation to him to open up this space to share these stories. When normally, if there was someone else there hoisting something to the roof, he would never have shared that story. But then it's, my, it's on me to pull my phone out and record it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there, oh, Dr. Caesar. Thank you, Daniel. I'm, I'm very honored to be here. I just really enjoyed your presentation and further um, getting to know it. Um, I guess uh, first, uh, I just want to uh, make a quick comment before I kind of ask the question. Here. I, I went to Pine Woods a couple of times, and I know that there's a, a strong relationship between the Pine Woods School and Wolf Studio. And one of the things is that um, there was a portrait of Lawrence Jones created by Wolf, right? Yes. Um, but something uh, that you talked about when you were archiving stuff, and Mrs. Wolf was like taking things and like putting it away, made me think of Grace, Grace Lawrence's wife, um, because I remember Mrs. Wolf was looking for pictures of Grace and she couldn't find me. And one of the things was Grace was always working right? She was always um, creating things and traveling and just doing like work. And so the fact that she emphasized to her that her preservation mattered, um, I just wanted to say that's a really great thing. One of the things I was intrigued by was your method in which you do your research, right? Because it is research. Um, and how you do it through a lens of care, an ethics of care. And honestly, we don't hear so many researchers talking about that, right? And or artists in like the traditional artist world. And so um, I, I took notes talking about transactional relationship versus nurturing relationships. And generally speaking, when we think of a Western society, we are coming from a very capitalistic, competitive, and at times overtly cut rope. And that is how you succeed, right? You have to be that way. But how did you get to saying, I am overtly going to work through an ethics of care to push my mission, but also with success? Because you're showing an alternative way of moving in the space. It's, it's like I wanted to do justice to, to the people in my life who have led me to care. And, and I'm never able to fully do justice you know, as we all are, never able to fully do justice to the people who've made me, made us who we are. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think, you know, generally where, where my mind is going to, without going to a particular person, but, you know, I, I think about the, the, you know, the mutual aid movements that, um, you know, 
black communities in America established, um, where there's, the, you know, it's, it's the, 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 the quality of it is, is very anti-capitalist. You know, it's, it's the pooling of communal resources, you know, the, the seeking of directing those resources to, to, the, to the people who need them, the, the creation of social services at, at a grassroots level, um, and, 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 that, and making it part of the work, you know, and within those organizations to, to pay people to do this labor, to care for each other. Um, and also the, the, um, the, the movement of, of black museums that that are are you know quite antithetical to the, the westernized idea of like kind of creating this this sterile object with an outside authority that's telling you what it means but but you know to gather you know to be very place based before we use that word to 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 demonstrate that there's an authority in the neighborhood um, you know, the objects of our community matter. They tell us something about who we are, um, the building knowledge from, you know, the people who are around us. Um, and, and while I'm not like talking specifically about, you know, using words like compassion or care or, or tending, like to me, that centering of, of authority and knowledge in the people next to you you know, that, that you know, the, the centering of the direction of resources to the people who need them most, most who are next to you, like that's, that's systemic care. And I'm, I'm really very much a systems thinker and, and had to kind of move through that to get to a place where I really thought about and started a list on my phone of like, what are the words that help me communicate, you know, the, the individual relationship, you know, words like friendship, and neighbor, like how do I start to use those words in the way that I think about and frame my work so that we transform what it means to work? So thank you so much for that question. And if my panelists have anything to add, this is this is our last question for sure. No, that was that was right on the money. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much to my panelists. Thank you, thank you to Daniel for having us. And thank you to my audience. You performed your role perfectly. And I believe y'all have lunch somewhere. What? Lunch? Where? Yeah, I should have sent y'all lunch. <laughs>